A coalition of scientists and security experts are pushing for a global agreement to save outer space from exploitation. It comes as the US forges ahead with its plan to mine the lunar surface. Joining me live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, good afternoon. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Firstly, what are the terms of the treaty that this coalition is calling for? Look, it's really trying to come together to um, have people work uh, on even ground. Uh, and that is that as we um, try and go to the moon, we've talked a lot about that. Uh, we want to use surface, uh, we use one of the, the sources of minerals on the surface. But they don't want it to be a land grab. And they don't want it obviously to be militarized. We want to look towards Antarctica as really the best way of doing this. And what people are worried about, including ministers and politicians, uh, is that at some point uh, we may have conflicts from mind grabbing. Uh, and what we're, people are trying to do is to say, all right, let's find a framework where we can benefit from the resources, but obviously not compete to, to own all of it uh, so we don't slip into these uh, militarized conflicts. And how complicated will it be to get all parties to agree to this? We know that there uh, is a space race between the US and China, but between that and the threat of Russia, it seems like it's going to be a very difficult task. Yeah, look, it's trying to get some of the big players who don't really come to the table to come to the table. Because at the same time, it's not even just the countries you have to bring to the table, it's the private companies as well. So the private companies who are working on this, like SpaceX and Blue Origin, need to work together with the countries um, to obviously do the resources as well. Now, they all have their own goals, they all have their own needs. Uh, and now there is hope that you could do this, like in Antarctica, where these countries, Russia, China, the US, Europe, all work alongside each other. But it's a bit of a different rule, and partly because there already is a treaty called the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty, which some countries agree to and others don't, like the US. And then the US has passed their own laws called the Artemis Accords, which some people may work on and some people know. So essentially, this is trying to say, look, it's getting really messy. We all know what's going to happen. We all want the same things to happen. Let's do this from the beginning to kind of work together to prevent these future problems. So I think it's good that this call is happening to get people to focus so we don't end up in a very uh, interesting arms race, let's say. Yeah, and certainly a start, whether they can agree, I guess remains to be seen. Now, Brad, right. speaking of China, it has launched and landed its first reusable spacecraft. What more do we know about this vehicle? Yeah, look, so China is only now the third country to launch a reusable space vehicle. So obviously the US and Russia have done this. Now it was in orbit for about two days. We know this both from um, information from the Chinese space agency and from independent tracking. What we don't know really is what it's been doing. They've been hinting at something like this may happen. And a lot of people are thinking it's like what the X-37B is. So the X-37B, as we've chatted about it a few times, is the US Air Force's kind of robotic space drone. Uh, now the US Air Force says it's um, being used for experiments. That's a very wide ranging term for experiments, especially when it's the Air Force. So what people think that this China vehicle is, is that it's ability to take humans into space, like the space shuttle, but obviously launch robotic uh, space missions. So it could be used all the way from human space exploration to militarized concepts and militarized testing of equipment. Now this is what the US does, but the fact that China's developed this quite quickly, they're, they're really coming on par with the US and Russia in terms of the technology, because you know, they did this themselves, not reliant on the US to give them their information. And we were just saying before about, uh, you know, a space race, how big yeah. of a milestone is this for China in terms of its space program? Look, I mean, every year they're doing these markers that are putting them closer and closer to parity. And they're only not at parity because they just started the race later. You know, it's kind of like there was a marathon, but the US and Russia took off way before China, but China's running really fast and catching up. And so I think then the question is, once they catch up, what's going to happen then? What is the US and Russia going to do almost in reaction? Are they going to change the views of their program? Are we going to see more collaboration again, like that treaty is hoping to bring together um, and more, or more joint activities? And obviously, the boundary between civilian space sector and, and exploration, like what NASA does, and military and defense space sector, not just in China, but the US, Russia, and even Australia, uh, will be interesting to see how that plays out over the next five years. Uh, you know, so this is just another milestone that China is quickly reaching. Now, Brad, on another matter, the moon is slowly rusting. It's changing its colour to a slight red. Uh, you know, when we think of rust, we think of household uh, items, but not necessarily the moon. But interestingly, it's probably Earth's fault. Why? 
Yeah, look, this is a bit of a weird idea, but as you said, it, it is actually happening. Now, if we look at Mars, for instance, a lot of that red dirt comes from iron oxide in the ground, and, and iron oxide is rust. And when we look at the moon, the moon is actually rich in iron. We know this on the, on the surface from measurements. Uh, we also know there's a lot of ice and water on the moon. Now, where Earth comes into play, and this obviously there's not a lot of oxygen there, but Earth gets in the way of the moon from the sun. And as the sun's wind blows on the Earth, we think that it's creating a reaction on the moon to increase this iron and add oxide, oxygen to it, um, to turn it into rust. And people have been able to see in some cases, if you take a, a high resolution photo, in some parts of the moon, there's this brown tint. And that brown tint really is the iron oxide. So it's kind of weird to think that the moon is rustier than when Neil Armstrong and people in the 70s landed on it uh, in 1969 on that first Apollo mission. Uh, but it is really happening. And it just shows how uh, things in space, even in shorter time frames, uh, do actually change. Is it at all harmful or dangerous to the moon? Well, you know, this is an interesting question because, you know, it obviously is changing its composition. It's changing what's on its surface. Um, but now that we kind of know what's happening, obviously people want to study this and an answer it more. Is it changing a bit of uh, the outside structure? Will it affect um, uh, some of the lunar dust, uh, some of the, uh, the water ice deposits as well? So you can be sure that as these next wave emissions land on the moon, both robotically and in orbit, uh, they'll do more detailed studies of this. It's just one of those things... To, you don't really expect to wake up and realize the moon is rusting, no. um, but this is what's happened. Well, the more, I guess, the space world uh, shows up some unusual traits, so that could be potentially right. one of them. Now, just finally, Brad, the world's biggest camera has taken its first image. How big is this camera? So, look, this is amazing. So this is, uh, camera will be for the Vera Rubin Observatory being built in Chile, and Australia's a partner in this. Uh, so this camera is 3.2 gigapixels, so 3.2 billion pixels. So if you think of your mobile phone camera, that's probably 10, 20 megapixels. So this is thousands of times more pixels, thousands of times bigger uh, than your mobile phone. So it really is a, a beast in the, the lack of phrase. Uh, and the reason is, is this telescope's going to be surveying the entire sky uh, and the southern skies repeatedly every few nights. So to take really big, deep images, you need a camera with lots of pixels so you can see lots of things and a lot of detail. So it's kind of amazing, a remarkable feat of technology this thing's been able to do. A photographer's dream. Brad Tucker, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Take care.